Well, good morning, church family. We are so glad that you are tuning in with us today for our online gathering. Wherever you are right now, we hope that you are staying warm and safe, and we are expectant of what God is going to do in and through this gathering this morning. If you are new with us, maybe you'd like some more information about our church, or maybe you've got a prayer request and you've been coming for a long time, you can do all of that by just sending us an email at connect at bsfbc.org. We hope that you enjoy the rest of the service. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Oh, a sweet, sweet sound. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you as we sing holy there is no one like you there There is no one like you. 
There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Those around me. Cause I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Well, at this point in the service, we are going to continue to worship through giving. Here at BSFBC, we want to give you a few ways that you could give. You can give right now online by heading to bsfbc.org slash give. You can also text in any amount to 864-412-0914, or when it's perfectly safe to do so, you can drop by your tithes and offerings in our drop box located outside of our main lobby entrance. Well, again, thank you so much for being here. If you're new, don't forget to send us an email at connect at bsfbc.org, and we hope that you enjoy this message from Pastor Hank. Well, good morning, First Baptist Boiling Springs Church family. So thankful for again for you to watching online. I'm assuming this morning we're actually pre-recording this on Friday morning. So I don't know what the snow event is like. It might be another 2014 snowmageddon. You may remember in Atlanta, they called it snowmageddon. It was one of the worst weather events in Atlanta history. It was only 2.6 inches of snow, but over a million people were stranded on the interstates. 99 school buses from Fulton County alone were stranded with 2,000 students until midnight that night. Hundreds of People had to abandon their vehicles in order to find safety and shelter. Uh, it was called Snowmageddon. So I don't know if this is going to be a Snowmageddon this morning, if we have one inch or if we have 10 inches. Um, what is your personal Snowmageddon? Tell me, your, what is your worst, your most uh, dangerous or serious uh, snow event in your life? I have my own personal Snowmageddon. I would share with you this morning. Heath and Mitch were just boys, maybe six or eight years of age. And we, we got hit with a, a 14 inches of snow in uh, the part of North Carolina where we live. And so everything was shut down, obviously, for about a week. But I was in our neighborhood. I was like the big kid. And so all the kids would come to our house to play basketball and hang out with, Pat, with Hank. And, and we would just do stuff. And so on that day, we decided I was going to go out. No other parents, not a single parent in the neighborhood except myself was willing to go out with these kids. And there was probably six or eight guys, young boys. And uh, we were going to go out sledding. And so we found this big hill and it was unfortunately through the woods. And so the path that we created, you had to dodge some trees on the way down toward the creek. And I was leading this band of kids out in this big snowmageddon in our area. 
And there was one kid, there always is, right? There was one boy, and he was always the boy that would whine and complain and not participate. And, uh, and he was there at the top of the hill. We had all had I'd already sledded down through the woods to the bottom, had a great ride. And we're trying to encourage him to do it. We're trying to coax him to do it. And he's crying. And he doesn't want to do it. And I tried to insist, you know, hey, look, man, here we are. It's, 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 it's not going to hurt you. You're going to be fine. So go for it, man. You got to do this. You got to be one of the guys. <laughs> and he finally launched out <clears throat> with his sled down the hill. Unfortunately, about three quarters of the way down at full speed, he T-boned a tree. He ruptured his spleen. Now, he's immediately crying, and, of course, we're all thinking that's just typical, his, his, his you know, usual sort of response to anything that happened. Fortunately, God gave me enough sense to walk up and just kind of just check on him. So I picked this boy up, carried him to his parents' home, looked at his mom and dad and say, you know, we were sledding down the hill. I'm the big kid in this group, and uh, we, he hurt. So we found out he ruptured his spleen. He did recover fully. Had no long-term issues, but it was sort of my personal snowmageddon when I became the parent in the neighborhood who endangered all the children. So if you're going to be out today, if it is a snowmageddon, uh, let me encourage you, first of all, don't invite me, right? But secondly, uh, be safe and enjoy the time out, uh, but absolutely take care of yourself. But as I thought about that, in my mind on this Friday morning, I have this picture of this beautiful blanket of fresh fallen snow on the ground that sort of represents something fresh, something new. No, no tracks have been made in, in this big, beautiful parking lot or field. No footprints yet. It's a brand new, uh, fresh fallen blanket of snow on the ground. And I think it sort of is a picture in my mind or a symbol, if you will, of this new year. And we are in now in the middle of our 21 days of fasting and praying. 21 days as we begin this new year, the year 2022, this first month of the year, this fresh fallen snow, this new year before us, where tracks have many tracks haven't been made, we haven't created any paths yet, no footprints yet much in this new year. It's why we begin every year with a 21 days of intense praying and fasting. As I picture that blanket of fresh snow. I pray for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit in my own life, in our church. I'm praying for a spiritual awakening as we take this time. And I, I encourage you, even if you've not yet started, to, to engage with us in this time of fasting and praying. Because what it says is, Lord, in this fresh new year, we want a fresh new beginning. We want to be renewed. We want to be refreshed. We want to prepare ourselves for this new year so that the tracks that we make and the paths that we create and the footprints of our lives will have such an eternal legacy and impact in our community as we're for Boiling Springs and for your kingdom that we're focusing our attention by, by setting aside something, fasting something, giving up something sacrificially, and then taking time to lean into that time of intense prayer so that on this fresh new year, we can experience a sense of renewal. And I realize even as I share that this morning, there are many of us that in some way are going through a season of spiritual warfare, intense spiritual warfare. Maybe you're suffering through pain or through loss, or maybe you're just fearful because of things that are happening in your life or in the world. And so I want to encourage you this morning when there, there's this natural inclination to be fearful, this natural inclination to, to worry, to be anxious, to let those kind of things control our sense of being in this new year. That we would take a few moments this morning as we look at God's word in Psalm chapter 37. The psalmist was facing oppression. He was facing attack. He was in a time of trouble. And so I want to encourage you with four words out of Psalm chapter 37, verses 3 through 7, that the psalmist really bolsters and encourages him and refreshes him and strengthens him rather than being anxious and fearful. It calms him and stabilizes him in his journey. And so I pray for that for you and for me this morning for a fresh 
sense of renewing in the Lord as we gather around His words. There in Psalm chapter 37, I want you to notice the first word is found there in verse 3. It says, trust. Just underline that word, trust. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. The Hebrew word for trust is the word batak. And it literally is the idea in its root, the idea of a person lying face down on the floor, prostrate, completely incapable of doing anything to help themselves or support themselves, but completely dependent, completely in need of help from some other source. And so that's the idea of trust. Even in my office this morning, I, I lay down in a, a prostrate and just cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, I am totally dependent upon you. I cannot help myself. I can ultimately do nothing for myself. And so I'm trusting completely, relying, leaning into who I am in you, trusting in the Lord. That's the idea. I encourage you at some time today or maybe this week in your quiet time at home, in your prayer closet or somewhere where you're alone, just to, just to lie down on the floor, prostrate. I think it's a, a posture that helps us remind us of how helpless we really are, how vulnerable we really are, how much we are dependent upon the Lord. And in that same way, the psalmist is saying, you can trust the Lord. You can, you can put all of your weight. You can give all of your life. You can surrender every area, everything to him because he's trustworthy. So he says, trust in the time of trouble. Trust relieves anxiety. Trust enables us to overcome worry. Trusting in who God is, who the Lord is in our lives and relying on him and dwelling, living in the land. It's the same idea of Paul when he was in the Roman prison, when he wrote Philippians and several of those epistles. He's there waiting a death sentence. And in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through, through 13, Paul says, not, not that I speak from one, for I have learned, I have learned to be content whatever circumstance I am. That's the same idea. I have learned that I'm here in prison, chained to the floor with guards on either side, awaiting a death sentence. I can't do anything for myself. I am completely dependent and trusting in the Lord. But I've learned that in whatever circumstance I'm in, I can trust the Lord. I know how to get along with humble means, he said. And I know also how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance and season. I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. And that's when he comes there in verse 13 to that text that we're also familiar with in Philippians chapter 4. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Trust builds strength. Trust in the Lord. Depend completely on Him. And then it says there at the end of verse 3, and cultivate faithfulness. And cultivate faithfulness. One translation says, feed on His faithfulness. As we feed on His faithfulness, it encourages and cultivates and deepens faithfulness in our own lives. And so as God is faithful we need to cultivate a spirit of faithfulness. You know, I've been praying for the last several months about this. We finished John after two years. We've been in the Gospel of John. About which direction the Lord would have me to go in, uh, in the spring. And over these past several months, I've just been prompted, I think, by the Spirit to a word. And though it's really not a sexy word, and it's not maybe a word that usually is on the top two or three of our list of greatest words, it's such an important word for our time, and it's, it's a word that I felt led to. It's the word faithful. I think in this season of uncertainty and unknowns, in a season where anxiety could press in and worry could consume us and control us, we need to know that God is faithful. And in knowing that God is faithful, that we are then, we cultivate, as the psalmist says, or, or feed on His faithfulness, so that it creates and cultivates in us a commitment to being faithful to the Lord. And so we're going to spend this spring, I'm going to do something I've never done now in 18 years as the pastor of this church. I'm going to preach through a, a character study. We're going to preach through the life of Abraham beginning next Sunday. As we think of Abraham, we think about that word faith. Maybe he's known as the father of faith. Maybe other than Jesus himself, no more prominent figure in biblical history than Abraham. And we're going to look and journey from 
Genesis chapter 12 through chapter 25 through the life of Abraham. And we're going to cultivate faith as we see and experience His faithfulness. We're going to cultivate, ask the Lord to cultivate faithfulness in our lives. And so the psalmist says, cultivate faithfulness. As you trust in God, it cultivates faithfulness in our lives. And then the second word I want you to see is in verse 4. The psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, too often times we've interpreted that as if you desire and delight the Lord, He'll give you what you want. And we tend to think of those temporal material possessions and sort of our wish list and want list, but that's certainly not the context. Again, David is under attack. He's facing tremendous battle or struggle or trouble. And what the psalm, what he's saying is, listen, I'm going to delight. I'm going to align my heart with the desire for the Lord. I want to find my sense of, of, of satisfaction and purpose and meaning and identity in you, Lord. I'm going to delight. I'm going to desire. I'm going to align my wants to you, Lord. And so the idea there, the promise is that if we do delight in the Lord, if we make him our great heart's desire, then he will give us the desire of our heart because the desire of the heart of the one that delights in the Lord is to have more of the Lord. And Jesus says, I'll give you all, I'll pour my life into your life. As you delight in me, I'm going to pour my life into you and give you the desire of your heart. So here's the question as application in that. What's my delight? What am I delighting in? What am I finding greatest joy in? What is my heart's desire for? And, and, and am I, am I being satisfied in him? Am I finding my genuine heart desires for more of him? And as that's my desire, I'm finding myself experiencing more of his presence, more of his power, more of his sense of, of him pouring his life into me. I can have all of him that I desire. And so he's delight in the Lord and he'll give you the desire of your heart. And then the third word I want you to see is found in verse five, Psalm chapter 37. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. The word commit. So we have the word, we have the word uh, delight. We have the word trust. In trouble, we need to trust. In trouble, we need to delight. Make sure that our hearts are aligned with him. And then he says commit. And the idea of commit there is, is the idea of well-worn paths. It's the idea of, of a lifestyle of committing our life to him, our lives. It's, it's, a, it's our habit track in life is to, is to do his will, is to walk his way. It's not the idea of a, of a New Year's resolution that we only hold fast to for a week or two and then we forget all about it and we abandon all of those principles or commitments. This is a lifelong, this is a heart commitment. This is a life direction commitment. And so it says, commit your lifestyle to the way of the Lord. Commit to live in His way. And in doing that, he will, he will bring forth your life and He will allow your light to shine His glory, His righteousness. And so we have trust, we have delight, and we have commit. And then let me show you the last word here in Psalm chapter 37. It's the word rest. Look what it says in verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way. And so I want you to see that progression as the psalmist says, with my face prostrate onto the ground, recognizing my helplessness, my total dependence on me, I trust in you fully. I delight in you. My heart yearns and desires you, Lord. I commit my life, my ways, my habits, my decisions, my every day to you, to walk in your way. And if I'll allow those three things, if I'm committed to those things, guess what? I can then rest. The idea of rest there is a beautiful word. It's the idea of being still, of sitting silently and just waiting in patience for the Lord. It's so counter to our culture where noise and clutter and busyness and activity governs our lives, where doing and, 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 and continually engaging in activities, it's so foreign to our sense of being, 
to sit quietly, to be still and know that he's God. And yet the psalmist says, in the time of anxiety, and in the time of trouble, I need to trust. I need to delight. I need to commit, but I need to rest. You know, the Lord says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. There is a Sabbath rest that the Lord has for his people. And he wants that rest for us to experience that rest, not just when the sun is shining and it's a beautiful day and life is good and everything is going as we would plan or design it. But he wants us to rest in the storm, to rest in the fierce trials of our lives. He wants to have a peace that passes understanding. And so the psalmist says, rest in his presence. Be patient, be still before him. And I want to encourage you this week to just take some time and sit quietly, to experience some solitude, some time of being alone in his presence and resting in him. The Lord desires to give you his rest, to let you know in the midst of of worry and anxiety that you can rest. You can be at peace. You can wait patiently for him, knowing that you can trust him. You can rest in his presence. We live in a time where resting is, is again, so difficult, so seldom a spiritual discipline that we experience and that we really lean into. And I really believe in this new year and all that we're facing It's going to be more and more important for us to find times of quiet, times of of being still, times of sitting silently in his presence before his word, meditating on his word, finding in him and in his presence that constancy of companionship. You know, we're living in a time where people are alone. As a matter of fact, Norena Hurst, who's considered a global economist, she's actually gone to several companies, uh, countries and offered her counsel. She's considered one of the elite thinkers in economists in our day. She's very secular, but she's written a book. And uh, that book is called The Lonely Century. The lonely, she says that the 21st century is the loneliest century in the history of mankind. The subtitle of that book is Coming Together in a World That's Pulling Apart. She suggests that three out of five people in studies, three out of five people between the ages of 18 and 34, think about this. We tend to think of loneliness as uh, an epidemic among those who are older, the elderly, who are alone maybe in life or facing uh, being alone. But she said there's a a loneliness crisis, a loneliness epidemic of those between the ages of 18 and 34. She said three out of five people, 18 to 34, feel alone alone often or all the time. You know that she suggests that one in five millennials cannot name a single friend in their lives. One in five have no friend, no person they can identify that they have a relationship with. They're lonely. You know, it's interesting that in the UK, a couple years ago, the loneliness epidemic was so bad and so identifiable, obviously, with the, with the pandemic and people having to isolate and quarantine. That has fed this whole loneliness epidemic. She says, again, it's the loneliest century in the history of the world. And that's exacerbated it greatly. So much so that the UK, a couple years ago, actually in their parliament, a position, created a position called the Minister of Loneliness. Can you imagine that? A minister in their cabinet, a minister of loneliness. It's so bad in Japan in a study that came out some time ago that the actual crime rate of those who were 65 and older in Japan has quadrupled. Now think about what I'm saying. That those who are committing crimes that are 65 and over, that crime rate has quadrupled. And as they begin to dig into that, here's what they found. Primarily, It was women who were 65 or older were actually committing crimes so that they would have to go to jail so that they wouldn't be alone. Women 65 and older in Japan committing crime so that they could be put in jail so they could could be around people. They were so lonely. And I know David faced that, that sort of serious crisis of loneliness in his own life there in the cave of Agilin and at different times where he dealt with depression. I want to encourage you today to know that with Jesus Christ, if you'll trust in Him, if you'll delight in Him, if you'll commit your way to Him, you'll find rest in Him. 
And he says, I will be a constant companion. I will never leave you or forsake you. You'll never be alone. You can know his abiding presence in your life. No matter what. But we need his presence. We need his power. And I'm praying that you will, in this season, uh, as you as you trust in him, delight in him, commit to him, and rest in him, you'll find his presence abiding in you, giving you peace, giving you hope, giving you encouragement so that you know that you're not alone and that you don't have to face life alone. Obviously, Marina Hurst says that we need to be connected to one another. It's the loss of connectedness. It's isolation. Then she says, by the way, social those who spend more time on social media talk about being lonelier. Social media doesn't, doesn't uh, alleviate the loneliness. It exacerbates it. So more time on, on the screen is not going to answer the question. She said we need to interact, and she's right about that, even though the, the solutions and remedies she offers are, are of this world and secular and really can't meet the deepest needs of our loneliness, and that is the presence of Christ, the dwell, indwelling of Christ, the salvation of the Lord, knowing His, His presence through forgiveness of sin, having a relationship, being connected to Jesus in the family of God is our only hope to find peace and to overcome what it means to be alone and lost. But we also need one another. So let me encourage you this morning as we begin this new year, as we're in this first month, to begin to once again reestablish those habits of attending church, of connecting. We need, she talks about the importance of the family structure as being a, an essential support for, for us to deal with loneliness. She talks about the meaningfulness of friendships and those who are co-workers and how we need to do things that, that connect us with people in physical ways, interacting in simple interchanges and conversations, interactions with people. But I want to suggest to you that that's what is so important about the body of Christ. You know, someone made the statement the other day that we need to make church the excuse for not doing everything else instead of the opposite. We make everything else an excuse not to go to church. We need to make church the excuse that we're not doing everything else because we need church. We need to be together because we need that connectedness that comes. We call them family groups. You need to be a part of a family group, or we used to call them connection classes, to where you are interacting with people by name, sharing your hearts, being vulnerable, and praying with one another, journeying together through the deep and difficult seasons of life and through the, the blessed days of your life. Having that community, having that family group is so critical, so important. So let me encourage you to begin to just make a commitment that you're going to determine this year that you're going to be faithful in attendance to the, to the, to the people of God to the, as we gather week by week. You're going to be here for our corporate gatherings, and you're going to commit, commit yourself to being a part of a family group. I love that. A couple chapters over, and I close. Psalm chapter 42, the psalmist sort of cries out with that phrase that we're so familiar with. As the deer pants for the stream, for the water, so my soul longs after or thirsts for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts, he says, for the living God. I pray that today that idea of the deer panting for the water, someone says that deer are constantly nervous creatures because of, uh, of predators, and so they're constantly um, nervous, looking around everywhere. And when they do that, they, when fear overcomes them, they tend to, they sweat through glands and, and that, that fear can, that predators can smell at a great distance off. And so they try to find water and they become thirsty and they run in panic and they've got to have water because when they drink water, that water then uh, washes away that, that uh, secretion of fear and sweat and it cleanses that and they're calmed down by drinking that water, by quenching that thirst. And so I want to encourage you this morning to run to Jesus. He's the living water. And he told the woman at the well, if you'll drink from this water, you'll never thirst again. Find in him today your rest, your satisfaction. I've learned, Paul said, to be content in any season, in any circumstance, through my personal relationship with Jesus Christ, through the living water you know that uh, Lake Tahoe out on the Sierra Nevada mountains there in the, in the border of California and Nevada is one of the deepest lakes in the world. It's 1,645 feet deep. Some men, two men, sitting in a boat with a bottle and a fishing string plumbed that depth, and sonar later confirmed that. But you know, if you were to take Lake Tahoe and tip it up on its side, you could cover the state of California 
with 14 and a half inches of water the entire state. There's that much water in Lake Tahoe. It's the second largest and deepest lake, uh, freshwater lake in our country other than the Great Lakes and Crater Lake. But Lake Tahoe could to give every person in the United States, there's so much water, it's so deep, Every person could have 50 gallons of water per day for five years. There's that much water. It seems like an unlimited supply. But I want you to know this morning that in Jesus Christ is an unlimited supply of living water to refresh, to renew, to strengthen you this morning. And so I just want to say again to you, trust, delight, commit, and rest in the Lord. And don't fret. Don't let worry win in your life. But run into His presence and find in Him the joy and the satisfaction and the refreshing spring of living water that will well up in your soul unto life. And find in Him that companionship and that presence that can enable you to know His glorious joy in his life that he has for you. Let's journey together in faithfulness this new year together as we begin next week looking at the life of Abraham. God is faithful and let's then feed on his faithfulness and cultivate a spirit of faithfulness in our own lives. Let's bow together in prayer. Lord, I don't know who's watching online this morning. There's some lonely folks, some folks that are facing incredible fear and anxiety under spiritual warfare. Lord, in this season of prayer and fasting, I'm praying in my own personal life for spiritual awakening, Lord, for refreshing in your spirit. I pray that for every person watching online this morning. I pray that for our church, for a spiritual awakening, a a sense of renewal, a sense of new, a new and fresh work that you're going to bring about in our lives. And through that, Lord, that would spill over that we could be four boiling springs in 2022 in ways that would be transformative in our community as we trust in you And as we delight in you and as we commit our way to you, help us also to rest in you, to find rest and peace in you this morning. So doing that, the world will see and know your great love for us. Lord, you know the anxiety, you know the trouble, the pain, the loss that everyone is going through this morning. I pray that like the psalmist, Lord, we can find in you that constant companion, that unlimited resource of hope, and peace, and living water that will quench the thirst of our soul today, that we can find rest in you, and that we can say with the Apostle with the apostle Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me today. To that end, we offer ourselves in fresh surrender to you this morning. Thank you for this good day, and keep our folks safe and blessed through this day until we see one another again in the next Sunday, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me encourage you again today to reach out to us at bsfbc.org. If you have any kind of a need or a prayer request, we'd love to minister to you. We're praying for you today. We thank the Lord for you, and we pray you have a blessed day in the Lord.